So, I mean, before I get to myself and what I do, I just want to uh, start this presentation on some uh, other note. This is a screenshot that I had taken from the St uh, Stack Overflows developer survey for this year. And what you see right in front of you is the st statistics that suggest that majority of the developers, they work for longer hours than they're supposed to be. And I mean, working for longer hours, it very obviously and very directly implies that uh, it has some implications on the working environment and even the family time that, that those developers manage to take out for a decent work-life balance. And this does not mean a very good picture for all of us and also subtly hints towards the fact that software developers are exposed to a very high risk of burnout and other mental health hazards. And industry needs to be paying attention to this and they need to attend to the mental health of uh, software developers uh, and carefully now. Now, um, yeah, I'm Vitika Mishra. Uh, I am a senior product designer working with GitLab at this moment. And today uh, I would be uh, talking about a few design practices wrapped around the topic, how adopting the approach to graphically visualize logical relationships in application structures and even config files. It could really help us define the future of developer experience in a way that takes the stress out of the job uh, of de developers considerably. All right, so let's get started. Now, I want to kick off this discussion by talking a little about a recipe, um, a recipe for burnout burger to put the upcoming topics into kind of a perspective. Uh, now let's get right into it. All right, uh, so here the recipe says that we start with imposter syndrome bread. Well, um, luckily that isn't so hard to procure in the software development industry. There's no defined boundary when it comes to software development. So you'd see like hundreds of events sprouting from here and there uh, happening all around you. Your colleagues working on uh, working through the weekends on their personal projects, uh, like really working hard on their side projects and uh, coming up with very interesting stuff. So there's just so much to compare with. I mean, there's so much happening around, uh, such great work that people are doing. And there you are still referring to Stack Overflow for inspiration. And you're kind of uh, left out feeling that no one else does it, it's just you. So maybe you don't belong here. And that's the imposter syndrome because when others do it, they probably don't do it in front of you. The next it says uh, competition salad. Well, uh, let's have a look at it. No dearth of that as well. So many people are competing so hard to stay in the small space of recognition that the game is getting so intense every day. And it's very simple to get the salad. Next is technical debt cheese. Well, um, you did a mistake uh, by not being born on time. And by the time you joined the technical, uh, joined the team, the technical debt had just piled up so much that it's so difficult to deal with. Nothing could be done there. Next, it says a uh, real developer syndrome patty. Well, let's have a look at that as well. Um, let's see what, where that, that could be sourced from. Uh, now, there might be some help available, but people around you, you, they are setting kind of standards that even if there is help available, this is the kind of help that you should expect, uh, accept, and this is what you shouldn't accept. So they, they also uh, tell you that what fits the rank of a real developer and otherwise. For example, real developers are too cool for the latest software development practices where they're skilled enough. They are very skilled with the uh, CLI, with their codes that they don't really need those uh, uh, upcoming uh, practices to ease their job. It's not for them. And I mean, if everything uh, listed here was not hard enough, just sprinkle a little, uh, I mean, put a lettuce of evolving tech for extra crunch. Um, if everything mentioned here was, wasn't good enough, technology keeps on evolving at lightning speed. Every fortnight you'd see a new framework being released, new languages coming into picture, the trend just, it just keeps shifting so fast and like every day, it gets really difficult to keep a track. But I mean, not everything is going unnoticed. Slowly this culture is kind of, uh, 
kind of seeping in into this uh, software development industry, like people have started to take note of all of these problems. Um, I mean, developers, they're getting conscious by each day and their perspective is kind of shifting. The shift is slow, but it's definitely happening. And in this uh, graph that I have in uh, front of you, uh, this is again from the same survey that uh, Stack Overflow conducted this year. And this mostly talks about the most important job factors, like what are people looking for when they're applying for jobs? What is it that kind of uh, helps them uh, make a decision to join a company? So if you see in the list, uh, I mean, languages framework, they of course, they take a precedence because that's very closely tied with the job, but otherwise they take into consideration what kind of environment they'll be working with, then if the schedule is flexible enough, then if there's possibly a remote work option, and then there's, there comes family friendliness. So we have good hopes for the future, but let's keep the ball rolling there. Now, um, taking a look into a day in the life of a software developer, like what does a regular day look like? them working on codes, like this is the general screen that they would be looking at. And if they're not looking at this, if they're not deep into coding, they're probably into some, looking at some other interface that, that's, that demands a very high cognitive attention from them. So yeah, I mean, even uh, for uh, like, things which are not directly coding related in the job, they, they would probably be looking at interfaces which are pretty complex and trying to make sense of the lists of the different data that they're presented. Now, since I mentioned config files, um, I mean, what role do they have to play here? Config files, they are the files that carry the data to configure parameters and some of the settings that needs to be taken care of uh, when it comes to software applications. Um, they're used for many purposes, and there's a chance that even if you're not a developer, you have sometime dealt with a config file in your life. Um, how to recognize them? Um, I mean, for example, if you have played around with an XML, JSON, or YAML, uh, so those qualify as configuration files, and uh, these languages, they are data serialization languages. So for images, if you take a closer look, what I've put in the picture at the extreme, uh, like uh, at the back, there is a screenshot of XML code. And if you compare it with something that's right after that, which is JSON, it seems pretty complex. And JSON seems complex when compared to YAML. Uh, so, I mean, JSON was created so that it's a, it, it's a more human readable language, which it kind of is if compared to XML. But uh, there's still the work needs to be done there. And YAML, it kind of took care of all of those concerns, but still if you uh, maybe just miss a space there, your configuration is not gonna work. So there are those trade-offs that you have to deal with when working with um, configuration files. And these are the files that, I mean, they're not just a developer's concern. Uh, if you're working in an organization, then there are personas other than developers that also sometimes uh, deal with the config files. And the reason I uh, explicitly mentioned that this could be a very good area for uh, like uh, using the graphic visualization approach to, because it, it makes a lot of sense that um, it would also be used with, uh, by people who are not very sound with uh, making sense of code. So why not just also touch upon this? Now I talked about like all of these complex interfaces. I talked about config files. There's what are the common problems that we see in both of these areas? Uh, let's take a look at that. So first of all, there's no real time feedback for their actions. I mean, they don't have like an immediate uh, visual feedback or uh, like some affordance that their the action that they have performed uh, like it's true or it, there hasn't been any error or anything of that sort. Next is consuming information in abstract state. So I'll again go back to this uh, screen. So here you see a list of things, but there might as well be a hierarchy present in this list, which is very difficult to decipher if you, uh, unless like you used all your focus and try to understand what's going on there. So, I mean, things are presented to users in such a flat 
hierarchy and in such an abstract state that making a concrete sense of it, it gets really difficult at times. Another thing is data spread across pages or even applications. So, um, I mean, there are companies which uh, strategically they do not use a tool chain because they uh, prefer to tie up their own, stretch up their own experience when it comes to software development. And what that leads to is uh, the information is like across boards uh, and for various pieces of uh, information, they have to visit various applications, if not pages, and it's like all over. So uh, to weave a bigger picture and to see everything from a bird's eye view, it, it is kind of difficult. Now, we talked about all of these problems, so uh, I would also take the liberty of proposing a solution here. I mean, uh, not an exact solution, but an approach that we could take in simplifying these problems and uh, getting ahead with it. So converting all of the lists and the data and the information that's uh, fed to developers into something that's visually consumable, that's not as abstract, but a concrete visual uh, representation of what's going on in the system so that they're able to take decisions, they're able to take actions on those uh, elements uh, with more confidence uh, it would be really helpful, but I mean, if you you may ask that, has that ever been done? Has that ever been a successful uh, venture before? And it, of course, it definitely has been. Um, so many of you would be aware of the the long list of visual programming languages available, right? Um, but I am going to touch upon a very specific one and talk about the philosophies and the principles they follow and how we could borrow those principles and create something equally amazing um, for a different target audience, and, uh, of course. So yeah, let's talk about Scratch. So in Scratch, uh, if you like read deeper about Scratch and try to analyze it, you would notice that they are specifically following certain principles which you may also, uh, they're kind of also borrowed from another system like how Lego works, but uh, they have implemented that in such a creative way that uh, it really helps uh, kids of a certain age to grasp those concepts easily and uh, like get ahead with the learning process. But yeah, talking in terms of umbrella terms, what are those philosophies? The first is tinkerability. What this means is uh, the interface, it invites you, it kind of uh, like gives you a playground to uh, experiment with. It gives you cues, it kind of is suggestive is na in nature. It lets you, uh, it, it provides you a safe place to experiment and play with and uh, create something new. For example, there's a lot of affordance here and it tells you that only an element of a certain kind could fit into the slot. So you would see that okay, what are the variations in that element of a certain kind? So what new could I do here? Because you're kind of feeling safe that this is not going to break. The next is fail soft. I mean, uh, in Scratch, what they follow is not providing users with an error state because they don't want to get to the state of having an error state to begin with. How they control it? Um, I've put this little example of uh, parameters. For example, uh, if, if you have to input speed, it appears as a slider. So it kind of controls how much you could feed into the backend so that it doesn't return something unexpected. Here, you can, can't go beyond the slider. You can't go below the slider. So your uh, action is kept in check and it ensures that you don't fail, uh, you don't break something in the system. And that's another fear among developers. Like they're very fearful of breaking things. I mean, um, I'm not so much into uh, coding, but like now and then when I put some uh, changes on Git, it really, I'm, I'm so terrified of breaking the branches. So I could kind of relate, but I know that things are much worse on the other side. The next is live feedback. Uh, uh, so. Scratch is, it has a live environment. So whatever you do there, you kind of see a live feedback on the same screen in a, a certain panel. Uh, now this, again, I'm not proposing to loan the exact solution, I mean, borrow the exact solutions from there, but the philosophy, for example, if users are provided 
a good affordance and feedback for the singular actions they perform, even not the batch actions, uh, they would be assured that they are on the right track and they are what they're doing is uh, like they're doing the right things there. The next thing I would want to talk about is the wave of no and low code. Now, these are the words that uh, you would have heard about a lot recently. Uh, there's a lot of discussion going on. Many companies are ad adopting this practice. So what is it all about? And what I make to uh, want to make very clear from the beginning is no code and low code are not the same thing, but I would be using these terms together uh, only to represent the overlap uh, in terms of benefits that these uh, both these philosophies have. Uh, yeah, and looking at what predictions are being made about the no code development. So Forrester predicts that no code development platform market will grow from 3.8 billion in 2017 to 21.2 billion by 2022. And this is, I mean, this is what we call exponential curves. Um, yeah, let's see what else is there. So I want to highlight some bright sides of no and low code. This particular screenshot, GIF that's going on here, it, it's from Webflow. Many of you would again be aware of this. It's a platform that allows you to create websites. And uh, why is it making such a buzz around is even if you have like slight knowledge of HTML and CSS, it lets you do so much more with or with the elements available on the screen that it kind of uh, magically gives you all the power that you would otherwise only have if you uh, thoroughly know the uh, JavaScripts and uh, other languages. So this really helps you attain a certain level of, uh, I mean, get to the next level at a much faster speed. So it provides better agility. This screen is from VoiceFlow, which is again, a, it's an application for creating voice-based applications uh, without using any code. And if you see what it is doing is in terms of uh, available interactions, it's, it's surfacing so much to the users that it is increasing the discoverability of those actions that they could take uh, in terms of uh, uh, the particular context that they're in, which if they just rely on the codes, it might not even occur to them that these things are possible. It might just get too difficult for them to, you know, go to their research, come back and uh, apply those codes. And if it doesn't work, then again, try to, you know, uh, fix it uh, and all of that. So easy to make bulk changes because of enhanced discoverability is what uh, no and low code provide. Next is, uh, an example from the OpenShift topology view. This is a project that I was very closely uh, working on when I was uh, working with Red Hat back in time. Um, and I especially wanted to point out this uh, particular example to highlight how uh, this approach of graphical visualization can drastically uh, solve the problem of dealing with the hierarchy and uh, semantic uh, meaning of the logical relationships between different components in an application, because an application is just an, it, it's not just a single entity, it's made up of so many things together. And unless you understand what's going on there, it gets so it, it gets really difficult to make a decision, like what should I do next? How, how should I fix it? And above all, to be able to be creative with it. I mean, if you're still like deep in this mess of solving problems related to how to get it working, how would you ever get to the point of making it better and uh, like more innovative? And everything that I have just talked about, it dramatically fits into this uh, list of metrics that surfaced in the State of DevOps uh, 2019 report. So these are the metrics that directly affect the performance of teams. And the elite performers were found to have uh, uh, these functions, like uh, they were frequent, there were more frequent code deployments happening uh, in those teams that were uh, noted as elite performers. And the lead time to from coming to deploy it was much faster. Uh, time to recover from incidents was also faster. So all this agility, how do we attain that? How do we uh, enable our system to be more agile. I know there are practices in place. I know there are uh, like 
this whole agile framework is there and there's so many variations of it companies are experimenting with all the variations but how do we like through the tools that we provide uh, enhance the agility of our teams so definitely going no and low code is an option there then comes uh, seven times lower change failure rate again i spoke about the approach that uh, scratch follows which is fail soft so by controlling uh, the actions that developers could take and uh, helping them avoid the situation where there could be an error and uh, helping them avoid failure you are sa saving so much of time there and besides saving time you're also kind of giving them that kind of mental peace that they're looking for uh, in their jobs they don't have to be anxious all the time uh, thinking about what might break what might uh, stay uh, and they could in a much more peaceful manner they can take better decisions and do their jobs now those are all very technical and very um, like process oriented uh, points that i just brought but low and no code they have this hidden side which is not so much talked about um, which is inclusivity so right now uh, to flourish as a software developer in the industry you have to be a person of a certain temperament certain skills and interest the expectations they are so intense that it only lets a certain population qualify uh, for the task uh, leaving behind a wide population uh, with different ability and perspective if no code and low code practices take over the people who are left out of the circle they would also get a voice they would get a become they would get a chance to become makers they will uh, bring in a diversity of thoughts and even take away the burden from the small diaspora of developers that is being crushed under the under the burden of expectations today so it's it is capable of solving a much greater problem than we are seeing at this point now coming to something that uh, i am very closely associated with so i'm very sure um, that i'm it's known that gitlab is known for its inclusive and open practices while there are so many parts of the entire tool chain uh, that take into account uh, into consideration many of the covered concerns uh, from the previous slides into their design practices i could only speak for the effort that i am closely associated with so um, i would talk about gitlab ci yaml like what's going on there now to define our pipelines in gitlab ci uh, we use uh, yaml and this is the um, this is how it looks i've just taken a screenshot for a bash pipeline here and uh, i mean this is what a generic pipeline looks like and once you run the pipeline then the visualization it kind of looks something like this so um right now the method to author it is it's largely by typing in the yaml file uh, and at the most use a linter maybe to identify if there's any break in syntax so that it doesn't uh, break when you run it and then you try to fix it but very recently an effort was taken that uh, we started to consider a more friendly way of authoring these pipelines because uh looking at the different personas and different uh, archetypes that deal with our product especially the section of the product uh, it is not very strictly constrained to the developer persona and uh, to make it easier for other personas to be able to uh, come and edit and even author the pipeline someday uh, we are trying to take a different approach like providing them with a, a different method altogether So this is a new direction that we have taken. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, to, these are the uh, very first, uh, I mean, very initial steps towards it. And uh, I've added a disclaimer that uh, it, these features they are still under design and development. Uh, the issues are definitely open. You can even go and have a look at those. Uh, and there's no commitment that they would be implemented in the exact way that I'm showing them. There might be changes. There might be not. Um, So this is a new direction that we are trying to introduce a visual builder for our pipelines. And uh, what we are also taking into consideration is uh, since there is no hard and fast uh, 
I won't say syntax, but uh, format for using YAML files. So uh, just like any other company, any other product, GitLab also has its own uh, recommendations file uh, authoring a YAML uh, 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 pipeline. So it has features like uh, include needs. Uh, needs, what it does is it, it, it establishes dependency between two jobs. And there are many more things like uh, triggering a downstream pipeline or a child pipeline and all of that. And even though the list is vast, it's, it's a pretty long list, not everybody's aware of those because it's not so easy to discover them. And if you discover them uh, with the current practice of going and typing the file, you have to keep in mind like what you've learned. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's totally up to your memory and up to your uh, ability to uh, look for things. So with this, with the new approach, we would be surfacing all of those superpowers that you provide to uh, users uh, that they could use in their pipelines. And therefore it would help them create something better than they used to. That's the plan. And um, yeah, this is the path that we are on right now. Then how would all of this, how is it going to benefit us? Uh, there's a very obvious chain of reaction that's going to happen with this. First of all, if uh, like things are simplified, interactions are simplified, tasks are reduced, the codes would be, would be of much better quality as a startup. Next, happy code. Uh, happy developers. So developers, if they are living stress-free, they are able to be more productive. They don't have to trade off their uh, valuable time that they could others otherwise spend with their families. Uh, they would be more available uh, for other things, for other activities, and they could have a good work-life balance. They could have a much peaceful uh, mind when they're working on their task, and therefore they'll be able to take much uh, sensible and much creative decisions. Next is, I mean, everything builds up to a high performing business at the end of the day. If everything is going smooth, then the business is also doing good and the uh, revenue is also going up. Now, I would like to um, end this with a note that um, you might not think that programmers are artists, but programming is an extremely creative profession. It's a logic-based creativity. I'm kind of reinstating this because it is not said very often that what developers do is creative as well. Their job is creative and it's high time that through the tools that we uh, provide them, we empower them and we enable them to take more creative decisions and be uh, of much higher value to the organization. That's all. Uh, I would be happy to take questions on this. Uh, yeah. All right. Open. Do these tools generate code? Uh, sorry, Michael, uh, can you, I think it, it was way uh, in the middle of the presentation when you asked this questions that if these tools generate code, so I'm not very sure which specific screen that was. Yeah, that's totally true. I, I very much agree that uh, how this profession is seen is not, it's not doing justice to this uh, whole art of programming. There seems to be ice bright side. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think they do because from what I have, like for Webflow, I've seen just like Figma and Sketch, they also kind of generate uh, code for the designs that we create. I think Webflow does the same. I'm not so sure about voice flow and uh, OpenShift is for a totally different purpose. So. was the next question uh, no code no code is great but it seems like a trade off between visibility and actual code you write so i mean initially the very first drafts i agree when when this approach is adopted it would be limiting it wouldn't be uh, like the advanced and the uh, 
and the users, the developers who are much fluent with the code, they won't be happy with it. But eventually everything evolves. And I think there would definitely be a time when this will be as much capable. So we should keep that in mind. That's, that's how I think about it. What else can I answer? Okay. Um, it was my pleasure. I mean, you all have been a great audience and I, I, I expected a lot many more questions, but thanks for being easy on me.